I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Hal Call was one of a kind. He was born in 1917 in North Central Missouri. He knew he was gay from the time he was 12 and wasn't shy about chasing after farm boys. He served in the Army in World War II and then went back to Missouri, got a journalism degree, and went to work for the Kansas City Star. That's where we'll pick up the story. But first, a warning about language and content. If you've listened to our earlier episodes, you know I let the people we feature speak for themselves, and I guarantee that Hal will speak for himself. But before you listen, I want you to know that some of what Hal says shocked me at the time I interviewed him and is still shocking to me now. He uses hateful language about women that's explicit and offensive. And some of what he says about the challenges faced by lesbians in the 1950s and 60s was simply wrong. But he was also at the forefront of the fight for gay rights, and he has an important story to tell. Here's the scene, and it was quite a scene because Hal Call's office was above the Circle J Cinema, which was a sex club and porn theater he owned and ran in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. I'd only been to a porn theater once before, and that was for a bachelor party for a straight high school friend. So I was a bit tentative walking in, but a little curious too. And I know that because my post-interview notes were unusually detailed. Hal meets me in the dark entryway, and I follow him into the theater which looks almost like a small chapel. No seats, just pews. I guess armrests would get in the way? There's a film showing and a couple of men in the audience. We go up a narrow staircase to a spacious, bright office. A long wall is filled floor to ceiling with video cassettes. Another wall is lined with rows of empty vodka bottles. We sit on a long sofa facing TV screens showing jerk-off films. I'm glad my grandmother is not listening to this episode. As I unpack my tape recorder and microphones, I tell myself I'm going to have to avoid looking up because I'll never be able to keep my train of thought. Hal is casually dressed in a crisp blue check shirt, jeans, and stylish glasses. He looks a lot younger than 72. He's got a ruddy complexion, white hair, and a trim mustache. There's a video camera set up on a stand next to where Hal is sitting, and it's focused on me. I clip the microphone to his shirt, and he reaches over to his video camera and presses record. I press record, too. You're, you're running now. Mm-hmm. My name is Harold L. Call, and I'm executive director of the Mattachine Society, Incorporated. And your name is? Eric Marcus. Eric Marcus. Okay. Do you have any kind of an affiliation or whatever that I should know about? Uh, No. I'm an independent writer working for Harper and Row on a new book, which doesn't have a title yet. It's an oral history of the struggle for gay rights covering the period from 1945 to 1990. And you figure rather prominently in there, so that's why I'm here today to talk to you. (laughs) Okay, Eric. Well, let's get going. All right. Um, There was a point at which... uh, you were arrested in 52. August, yes. I was in a, uh, a very small automobile. It was a, not re- it was a two-seater, but it was a, one, a two-door, two-seater uh, Chevrolet or something. Parked uh, at about 1.30 in the morning, uh, uh, about 50 feet from the uh, police station in Lincoln Park in Chicago. How many people were there in the car? There were four of us. Uh-huh. We had gone from a gay bar. They were going to drive me home, but they stopped in the park. By, as soon as the ignition in the car was turned off, they were flashing lights on us. Three of them thought that uh, uh, if they made accusations, uh, it would let them get off scot-free, and it would uh, put the onus of guilt on uh, another person. Well, those three knew each other, and I didn't know them, and they thought they'd walk off scot-free, but they got busted too. See, all four of us did. And the attorney that uh, we got, uh, he was in with the system, and uh, at that time, 1952, $800 bought off the uh, arresting officer, officers, and uh, the judge, and the and included the attorney, attorney's fees, so that one court appearance uh, brought a dismissal. There was no conviction. Mm-hmm. To be accused was to be guilty. And at that time, I was uh, dumb enough that I didn't uh, 
see that there was any harm in telling my uh, supervisor in the Kansas City Star what had happened. He said, well, you can, we can't have anybody like that working for the Kansas City Star. And I said, well, uh, that may be so okay, but uh, I said, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you fired all the homosexuals on the Kansas City Star, you wouldn't get the newspaper out. I told him that. I mean, you couldn't even set the linotype <laughs> at, the, at the time. <laughs> I decided then that instead of going where the job took me, I was going to go where I wanted to and find my own career. So my lover and I uh, drove from to uh, San Francisco with all of our possessions and I've been here since. In February 1953, I heard that something called the Mattachine Society out of Los Angeles was having meetings and discussion forums in Berkeley near the UC University of California campus. And they were getting together to figure out things they could do to help resist this awful thing that we had to face. And that was uh, cops that were chasing us and playing cat and mouse with us all the time and at will. What, what happened at that meeting? Were there a lot of people there? No, about 15 or 20 people. Was it all men at the meeting or there were women too? No, it was, it was all men. Let's get something straight right here right mm -hmm. now. I know that uh, women's liberation in this country has come a long way and anything that goes on now has to be spoken of in two genders, male and female, all the time. Now, in the days I'm speaking of, these early days of the gay movement, the women weren't in it. They didn't have any problems compared to what the male did. It's only since the movement got going that the women have come forward, and honest to God, it has been an astounding revelation to me. I never expected to see a mile and a half of dykes on bikes in a gay parade ever. And plenty, believe me, that's well, that's too many dykes on bikes as far as this old guy is concerned. Okay. Why do you say that's that? That's all for freedom. Well, because I think the women have been awfully pushy here in the last few years and have sort of taken over in the thing when they don't need to. They've made a concern out of things that didn't need to be concerns. Mm. The police were playing cat and mouse with guys. The male homosexual, because he was a cocksucker and because he played with his penis and somebody else's penis, was a threat to the straight male. Females didn't count. The only thing wrong about a poor lesbian, as far as the males thought, was that poor cunt doesn't know what a good time she could have if I could stick my dick in her. She's just missing out. Mm -hmm. Poor thing. Mm -hmm. And they pitied her. Now, I'm not, look here, I've got wonderful friends that are lesbians and wonderful friends that are women. And Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin of the Daughters of Belitis, the founders of that organization, are wonderful personal friends of mine and have been since 1955 or so when I met them. As a matter of fact, we printed on our gay press down at Third and Mission the first issues of their lesbian monthly magazine, mm -hmm. the, the latter. latter. You became deeply involved in Mattachine yes, very early on. It was first a secret organization. Why did it have to be secret? That came about because of fear. Uh, the core of it was a secret organization, and Senator Joseph McCarthy in Washington, D.C., was going around, you know, with a handful of names and addresses of so many people that were in the Senate or in the government in Washington. And these are homosexuals and these are communists. And he was going, he was, he was putting the fear of God uh, along with those two queens that were associates of his, you know, at the time, Cohen and Shine. They both turned out to be uh, fairies without wings. Uh, <laughs> anyway, McCarthy was doing his uh, thing and spreading fear among homosexuals and among uh, all kinds of people and having lots of time on uh, television and, and the like, and equating the condition of homosexuality with communism. And of course, communis communism at that time was, a, 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 was an ogre, was a, 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 a specter, or a, a demon that uh, we can't even imagine today. So, that was we knew that some of the founders of the Mattachine movement, or the inner circle of the Mattachine uh, uh, foundation had, had been rumored to have some communist leanings and maybe connections elsewhere, particularly one or two of them, Chuck Rowland and another man, uh, and those were among the six or seven people who founded the Mattachine Foundation along with Harry Hay. We met in 1953 in Los Angeles at 8th and Crenshaw. We had two meetings there and uh, uh, a month apart, and on the second meeting we were sort of took it out of their hands. 
We were getting, we had the bit in our teeth of it, and we were running away with it almost. How 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 are you doing that? Was it your, your ideas different from theirs? Or? No, we wanted to see it become a foundation, or become an organization, and expand and spread. But we wanted to know who was who in it, what our backgrounds were, so that we couldn't find that uh, we had a, a a person in our midst who was going to be who could be. Uh, uh, let's say revealed uh, with some kind of ulterior motives and so on, and, and you know, and disgrace us all. A communist, for example. Yes. A communist infiltrator. Communist was the fear, and we knew that if we got organized and so on and got going uh, into something, that the FBI and other government agencies would find out about us, and we wanted to so we could with we could stand up and say who we were and what we were about, and stand their their investigations and not be accused of saying these other things. Mm -hmm. And several of you disagreed in terms of the philosophy of, of the organization. We did. Can you tell me what, what that was about? I felt that the foundation people were sort of uh, pie in the sky, erudite, erudite and artistic, uh, artistically inclined. Uh, Harry Hay, you could never talk to him very long that he didn't go back, way back in history, generations and centuries, to the Burdash or to some ancient Egyptian uh, cult or something of that sort. And he was always making Mattachine and the homosexual of today uh, a, a parallel to some of those things that were uh, in his studies and research. We saw the need for Mattachine as a here and now practical thing because we were a group of cocksuckers in the society that the police were chasing and they were just, uh, assassinating character at will and causing all kinds of mischief and expense and, uh, and damage to us as individuals. We didn't want a secret organization. We didn't want a, a sub rosa group within our society. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see changes brought about, changes in law, uh, changes in public attitudes, uh, research and education done, changes in uh, research into the realities of sex behavior and to spread those realities so that the whole of society could say, Ultimately, that uh, homosexuals are human beings in our midst, and they're only different in certain ways from the rest of us, and they're, and they're, they're human beings, leave us alone. We were wanting to see those goals achieved, and by evolutionary methods, not revolutionary methods. Tell but, me what you mean by, by evolution, how you hope to achieve that, that well, we goal. Hope to, mainly, we hope to achieve it through uh, projects of education, mm -hmm. and public service, and referrals, and things of that sort, and by meeting with, and telling our stories to, people who were doing uh, writing, research, and uh, who had an influence on law, law enforcement, the courts, justice, and people in the academic world, and so on. So you were, your plan wasn't to go out and uh, lead protests? No, nope. or, or... not at all, not at all. We wanted to see it done by uh, uh, holding conferences and discussions and uh, being, becoming subjects for research and telling our story and letting people uh, uh, in the academic and, uh, and science, uh, behavioral science world get the word out about these realities because we were so goddamn dumb as a people about the realities of human sexuality. Early in our days, we had our, the Mattachine phone number in our telephone book here in the city of San Francisco. And uh, it wasn't long before the police knew about us because through, the, through gay bars, uh, that we had uh, in San Francisco back then, not as many by any means as we have now, but we, we had maybe a eight or ten gay bars in 1950, uh, 1953, and uh, the cops were making arrests there, and then we were getting calls from a lot of the people they busted to uh, arrange for an attorney and even to arrange for a bail bondsman and things like that. Mattachine was doing those things in those early days. Uh, and so the cops found out there was a Mattachine Society, the, a, a, a group that, uh, of queers that was uh, daring to stand up and work on behalf of other queers the police were busting. And the courts and all found it out, and the attorneys found it out, bail bondsmen knew it, and so on. That started the spread of knowledge of the existence of Mattachine in San Francisco. There was a statement that I read, and I'm not sure I understood it. It said, uh, Mattachine urged homosexuals to adjust to a pattern of behavior that is acceptable to society in yes, general and compatible with the recognized institutions of home, church, and state. We what did. did you, what did you mean by that? I'm not sure I understand that. We knew that uh, if we were going to get along in society, it was our feeling at the time, we were going to have to stay in step with the existing and predominant mores and customs of our major society and not stand out as uh, sore thumbs too much 
because we had we didn't have the strength of tissue paper to defend ourselves. Keep your sex life very much to yourself, very much in private. And it also meant don't go wearing your heart on your sleeve. We didn't have sex symbols and gay flags and, uh, and those kind of things. Wouldn't dare have hold hands on the street. And you couldn't even put your hand on another person's shoulder in a gay bar without it being lewd conduct. We had dra people in drag uh, that would come out on Halloween where they, where they, they knew better, but they dared to do it. They knew their chances were that they were going to be busted, and the cops could do any damn thing they wanted and chase us around like little quail out in the, out in the brush, you know, where all we had to do was run and hide. So you were encouraging people, you were advising people in a way to help them avoid getting arrested. Help avoid getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because if you got arrested and your name got in the paper, you're going to lose a job if you had one. And at the, in those days, the examiner printed in bold type on the front page the names of every gay person arrested his age, his address, his marital status, his employment status, and his professional status, if any. And my God, when that happens, and they're accused of lewd conduct, 647A and all that, that's sucking cock, man. That's the filthiest thing on earth. When those things happened, divorces, suicides, uh, uh, wrecked careers, the loss of, uh, of rental uh, spaces where you were living, and all kinds, of, and the loss of credit, and, and all kinds of things uh, resulted from it. By today's standards, we were a bunch of uh, limp wrist pussyfoots. But yet, for us in those days, we were out of the closet, and it was a very courageous thing, because there were not very many of, uh, of us there. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, did you think at the time that, that homosexuality was sick? Was that what you, what, what the prevailing belief was? Mm -hmm. Did you believe that then? No. No. I never believed it. I had this philosophy. We've been fighting for sexual freedom, and God damn it, let's have some. Uh -huh. And so what? If you don't like it, look the other way, do something else. Do what mm -hmm. you want to do. Don't bother with it. Mm -hmm. All along, it's been a matter of that, you know. The people that are so incensed and concerned about uh, what homosexuals are doing are simply telling me that they are goddamn jealous because they're not getting enough themselves. Mm -hmm. What was the Seven Committee? The Seven Committee was, a, was a, I should tell you, there's a few people who have spoken very fondly of the Seven Committee, and they haven't quite explained it, so I thought I'd go to the source <laughs> well, uh, and find out what right. the Seven Committee was. Yeah. Uh, it's a, the Seven Committee is the name of a group that the, uh, within the Mattachine Society comprised uh, of a good many of its board of directors at the time and two or three others that we, we set it up to arrange social events. And we did it because we said we've been fighting, and we are fighting for sexual freedom, then God damn it, let's have some within responsible limits. So we had some overnight weekend outings down uh, in the, the Redwoods in Big Sur country, and uh, we had maybe a, a thing or two up at, uh, in, in somebody's ranch or something up in the Guerneville area and district, and uh, sometimes we even had a few little things in some of our own uh, apartments or quarters or facilities here in the city but you didn't get and they were just mainly they, they were sort of they well they were sort of all night uh, fuck suck and circle jerks <laughs> and we often had you know, cooked food like beef stew or a pot mm -hmm. of big pot of american chili or something you could make a big one dish pot out of and it was a social activities thing under the mattachine society in a sense but we didn't want it so that it would ever rub off on mattachine and uh, you might, you know, sort of smirch our good name. But after all, we're gay sexualists and we were fighting for sexual freedom and that's what I said. We, we decided let's have some. You heard Hal say that it was only the men who were hounded by the police, that the women didn't have any problems, at least compared with the men. That is simply not true. Lesbians were frequently harassed, beaten, and thrown in jail because of who they were. Like Shirley Willer, whose story you heard in an earlier episode. She got slapped around by a police officer simply because the way she looked and the way she dressed made him think she was a lesbian. Hal had his own perspective on things. He spoke his mind and didn't care who was listening. I found it hard to look past his words to what he accomplished, but whatever I might think of him, Hal was also a pioneer who took big risks to fight for equality and sexual freedom. Not every LGBT champion is someone I'd call a hero. It's complicated. After that first interview with Hal, I went back to do a follow-up interview. 
When I got there, it was clear that he'd confused appointments. Hal thought I was there to be taped for a film. He was sitting on his sofa in a shirt and his underwear and black socks and shoes, and there was a towel and a bottle of lube on the coffee table. Like the last time, his camera was pointing at my seat. Now I can laugh about it, but back then I was mostly creeped out. Hal Call lived in San Francisco for the rest of his life. He died on December 18, 2000. He was 83. If you'd like to know more about Hal Call, please visit makinggayhistory.com. That's where you can listen to all our previous episodes, including our episode with Chuck Rowland, who was crushed when Hal Call took the Mattachine Society away from him and the other founders. We have a small crew here at Making Gay History, and everyone goes above and beyond. Thank you to our executive producer, Sarah Burningham, our co-producer, Jenna Weiss-Berman, and our audio engineer, Casey Holford. Jonathan Dozer-Ezel created and manages our website. Will Coley is our social media strategist. Making Gay History's theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division. Season two of this podcast is made possible with support from the Ford Foundation, which is on the front lines of social change worldwide. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to Making Gay History on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. So long, until next time. <laughs>